Yeah, so we're doing Matthew chapter 23 today. It's an intimidating chapter. It's an intimidating, especially for me, but I, I think you will find it intimidating as well. It's a, it's a kind of chapter I, I don't really ever want to preach on. Um, and that's kind of why I felt I should. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to do it. It's, it's going to be great. Um, th this, is, this is the one chapter in the life of Jesus, according to Matthew. You know, you have these four different Gospels, uh, but especially in Matthew, where Jesus just cuts loose. I mean, he lights up the Pharisees. There is no, there's no, like, uh, finesse. I mean, it's just... And... Uh, so let's, let's just dive in and, and, and see where it takes us and see what we can learn from Jesus. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1 says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with a finger. Verse 5, they do all their deeds to be seen of others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Let me pause there. Just to start off, the, the scribes and Pharisees, we don't, we don't have these kinds of people today. Uh, so maybe just a couple of words to, just to, to talk about who these people were. A scribe is a scholar. Is essentially what a scribe is. It's somebody who had, the, uh, had, had taken upon themselves to learn how to, to write, which was not a common needed skill in the ancient world. And so most, most people couldn't read anyhow. So being able to read and write wasn't all that significant. And literacy rates are, are pretty much guesses for the ancient world. But something like maybe 10% in, uh, in a big city uh, could read. Now, in a Jewish area, though, there's this long legacy of scribes where they've preserved these scriptures from century to century, and it was considered a very noble profession. I mean, these are the custodians of the very words of God recorded, I mean, originally some of them on stone, right? And that now these scribes have, have passed it down century after century. Uh, so it's, it's a very high prestigious position, and something that your average person would look, look up to and say, oh, wow, you're a scribe. Not only can you, can you read and write, or at least write, but you also know what the book says. I mean, you really know it. And they were experts, and that was a, a profession. And then the Pharisees. The Pharisees are different. The Pharisee is not a job. There's no job called Pharisee. It's a, it's a group. It's a, a sect of Judaism. There were about five sects in, um, that's S-E-C-T-S, in, um, today we have five sexes, but that's another story. Uh, this is five sects in, um, in Judaism, and Pharisees were one of those groups that you could, you could join. And if you joined the Pharisees, you, had, you, you lived a certain way, you thought a certain way. And this group really came out of a period about 200 years before Christ. And uh, there was a lot of pressure among the uh, the higher-ups in the society to conform to the Greek way of thinking and doing things. And so we read about this uh, in some historical documents, but essentially what happened is some really influential people in Judea, they said, you know, ever since we, uh, you know, we don't adopt the Greek customs, the whole world all around us, Alexander the Great had conquered and had really privileged Greek culture, Greek language, Greek idol worship, statues, and so on. And they, basically what they said was, if we could just get with the program, then we wouldn't have so many problems. You know, we could, be, we could have better trade. It would be great. So there was a real uh, push among the Jewish people 
about 200 years before Christ, to adopt Greek customs. And one of the big things they brought in was the gymnasium. And I know what you're thinking, why is basketball such a big... No, it's not basketball. Basketball is an American invention. Uh, the gymnasium was a place of education, a place of learning, and a place of athletics. And uh, how do I put this delicately? All right. The word gymnos, which is the, like the word gym, is the, is the Greek word for naked. So we'll start there. Um, Jewish men have a difference than other men when they're naked that you can see. All right, we'll just leave it there. And if you got it, you got it. But uh, anyhow, uh, so you have these Jewish boys and these Greek boys, and they're they're wrestling and they're and they're learning Greek philosophy, and they're they're just adopting this whole culture. And there's a group of Jews at this time who says, "This is unacceptable." This, this is going right into um, immoral living, and they're, we're, we're going to be right where we are. The whole history of our people is worshiping these other gods and falling into idolatry, and, and we're, we're going to hold the line. And this group of people is called the Hasidians, the Hasidians. And so the Hasidians arose, and, and they, they really did everything they could to bring the Bible up to date. And what I mean by that is not that they changed the Bible, but that they interpreted it and, and figured out, like, what does this mean today to us in this situation where we find ourselves? And it was this whole revival movement where they're trying to fight the youth going crazy for this pagan culture. That's where the Pharisees came from. They're an offshoot of the Hasidians. There were three groups that came out of them. One was the Sadducees, one was the Pharisees, one was the Essenes. But the Pharisees were a significant offshoot of the Hasidians, and so they are, I mean, look at verse 1, uh, or verse 2. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. I mean, the Pharisees sat on that seat. They're, they're, they consider themselves the present-day Moses, the person who is explaining to the people how to, how to worship God, how, how, to, how to be righteous, how to do the right thing. That's what Moses taught the people. That's what the Pharisees are doing. So when we read Pharisee, as modern Christians, <clears throat> we think to ourselves, oh gosh, I hate the Pharisees. They're always criticizing Jesus, right? Isn't that what we think? Well, that's, that's our perspective post-Christ. But in this time here, people would have looked up at the Pharisees. They would have seen their, their distinctive clothing, their broad, um, what was that? Uh, yeah, their broad phylacteries and their, uh, their extra long fringes on their garments, and they would have thought, oh man, those Pharisees have it together. Those Pharisees, you know, maybe someday I could become a Pharisee. Maybe I could join, maybe they would have me. <coughs> so that's, that's how people would think about the Pharisees. There's a large number of Pharisees. Their focus is on the law. It's not so much on the temple and other things. But they really focus on the law. How do we understand the law? How do we, how do we live it today? That's what the Pharisee is all about. So when Jesus says these things, it is just jaw-dropping. It's just like, what? I mean, he's picking the holy people in the society and saying, do what they say, verse 3, so do observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but they do not practice. Obey them, but don't imitate them. Right? Do you, you see how that works? They preach, but they don't practice. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the definition of hypocrisy. This is what hypocrisy is. According to Merriam-Webster, you ready? This is the official definition. The behavior of people who do things that they tell other people not to do. That's what a hypocrite is. Someone who does the things they tell other people not to do. Um, verse 4. They tie heavy burdens... They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with, the, with their finger. So Jesus is, is looking at this group of people, and he's not, he's not just alone in this scenario. He's not like writing this in a room and, you know, in, in safety. I mean, the Pharisees are there, and he's talking to a crowd of people, and his disciples are there. So this is a whole mixed audience. And he, and he says to them, look, these guys, listen to them, but don't follow them. And, uh, and then he says to them, these guys, you know, they, they put all these burdens on you. 
Uh, this, this could have been a, a reference to what's called a fence law. Do you know, are you familiar with that, a fence law? Fences are, fences are great, like if there's, uh, you, you ever drive on a, a, a steep road where uh, off, just past the road, past the shoulder, there's a drop off, if you ever, yeah, and there's a guardrail there so that if you got a flat tire or if there was an accident, you would hit the guardrail instead of <laughs> crashing at the bottom, right? So that's, that's like a fence, you know, like you're not actually in danger until you cross over, but you don't put the fence right at the edge. You, you, you move it back just a little bit so that there's, there's some leeway there. And the Pharisees would make all these fences. And so uh, one, of the, one of the rules, one of the laws was you, uh, you, can't, you can't work on the Sabbath day, right? So, but what if you're, uh, what if you're walking along and you're, uh, you're chewing a grape? You know, you got a little grape in your mouth, you're chewing, oh, it's a seed. So you spit out the seed. Is that sowing? <laughs> right? I mean, is that sowing? Because, I mean, you, you, you've got moisture, you spit it, it's in the dirt. It could very well grow into a great vine. I mean, right? So, all right, no, no spitting on the Sabbath. <laughs> See, if we make the fence law right there, you're never going to get out into the farm and actually start picking grapes or, or doing other stuff, right? So the fence, the fence is right here. It's like no, no spitting anything, okay? If you don't spit anything, you'll never spit a grape seed. If you don't spit a grape seed, you won't be able to break the actual... So they, they're erecting these fence laws around these other things. And uh, verse 4, they tie up these heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They're ready to tell everyone what to do and what not to do, but there's no compassion. There's no, let me walk alongside you here. This reminds me of two, uh, two examples in Christianity today where we're doing, I, th I think, we're doing this well. Um, and the first is these uh, crisis pregnancy centers, all, all across, over a thousand of them all across the United States. And uh, what they do is have a woman come in uh, who's considering abortion, and, and they'll show an ultrasound, and they'll talk to her, and uh, what they'll say to her is, look, whatever you need, we're here for you. If you need money, we'll, we'll help you get on a government assistance. We'll, uh, you know, if you want adoption, we'll, we'll connect you with the adoption agency. If you need uh, diapers, if you need prenatal vitamins, whatever you need, we will find a way to get it for you. And they, they don't say to the, the woman in crisis, they don't say to her, don't get an abortion, it's sin, you're going to hell. Instead, what they say is, don't do this, and we're here for you, and we will help you carry this burden so that you can, you can make it all the way through, whatever choice you end up going with. And uh, I think that's a good example of the opposite of the Pharisees. The other one I think of is, is the recovery community with alcohol and drugs, where it's not just like don't do drugs or don't drink, don't get drunk. It's, it's like, look, don't do that, but we're here for you. We have sponsorships, we have meetings, and we're going to walk with you through this so that you can get to the other side. You know what I mean? And that's, those are two examples today where Christians are uh, doing a good job here, where it's like, yeah, there is, there is a rule. And Jesus is not saying, hey, there's no rules. Let's like all party and forget everything. No, he's not saying that. He's just saying uh, the rules, the rules uh, are, are fine. It's just you've got to have compassion. You know what I mean? And offer to walk alongside somebody. It's easy to say no. It's hard to say I'll walk with you. Uh, let's keep going here. Verse 5, for all their deeds... They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and the greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. Um, rabbi, rabbi. You, you, you say to somebody, oh, hey, how, how, are you, how are you doing? And you say their name and say, well, it's actually Dr. So-and-so, excuse me, or it's... It's your reverend, so and so, or um, what other titles we have? Your honor, you know, we have it a lot in the government. You know, you know, officer, and you know, don't you ever address a, a police officer just by like the name on the tag? It's officer, you know. I mean, we, we have this in our society today, and it, it, the issue is not so much the title for respect. The issue is the heart of the person who who's carrying the title. Okay, um, 
For example, in 1 Timothy 5, 7, uh, or 5.17, it says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And then 1 Peter 2.17 says, Honor everyone. <laughs> How about that? Love the brother, brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Let's go over to Matthew 6. Keep your finger there in 23. We're going to be back. Uh, we're going to get to the, uh, the more intense stuff in just a minute here. But uh, this, is an important, this is an important subject. The, the, the attitude you have about yourself when it comes to how people treat you and why you do what you do. This is, this is really the core, one of the core messages that Jesus, our rabbi, taught us. And it says in Matthew 6, beware of practicing your, in verse uh, 6, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in, in heaven. That was chapter 6, verse 1. Sorry about that. But th the point is, don't practice your, your righteousness to be seen by people. That's not why we do the right thing. Why do we do the right thing? It says right here, to your Father who is in heaven. That's why we do the right thing. Look, you can look exactly the same. You can have two people do the right thing, and like Terry's looking, and Blake's doing the right thing, and Maria's doing the right thing, right? And one of them is doing it because Terry's watching. And the other one's doing it because God's watching. It might look the same on the outside. It's hard to see that, right? But God sees right to the heart. And Jesus, and Jesus, look at this, verse 2. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. I mean, there's a way to give that lets everyone know. Right? There's a, there's a way to give... And, and uh, I, I've even been to some, some churches like this in the, in the South where you, you, uh, you wave your offering in the air and stand. And then you march it to the front, and there's a big march. You put it in the bucket. Everybody knows who's giving. I don't know what that is. I mean, he says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Right? I mean, th in other words, it's between you and God. If you're, gonna give, if you're, gonna, if you're not going to give, then don't give. If you're going to give, then you do it because of God. You don't do it so that Donna thinks, oh, well, you know, I'm going to hit this row. They, there's some big givers over here. Right? <laughs> you know, like that's not, that's not the mindset that we're, we're to have. We're not doing it for recognition and for people. You do it for God. And if you do it for God, that's what matters. And he'll take care of you. And if you do it for people, Jesus says, I hope you got a good, uh, a, I, hope, I hope you got a good reward for that. Because that's it. You're done. And then verse 5, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. <coughs> Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray... Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So when we pray, the reason why we pray is not so that people think we're so spiritual. We don't pray so that everyone says, oh, that Jim Bodner, gosh, he, that man can pray. That man can pray. When he prays, whoo! Now look, Jim, you may have that prayer, but that's not why you should do it. You do it for God, right? We pray for God. We don't pray so that people will look at us and say, oh, wow, you're so eloquent. That's not why we do it. Look, if you want to be eloquent or not eloquent, that's not really what matters. What matters is your heart, when you do it, needs to be for God. And then the last example, verse 16, Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount here. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. It's just so silly, isn't it? This is what kids do, isn't it? <laughs> Say, what's going on? I don't know. I'm just so hungry. <laughs> My cheekbones are showing. <laughs> right? <laughs> You're just trying to, like, exacerbate it so that everyone, everyone sees it. You know, you walk around, you've got it all sucked in. You're like, two more days on my fast. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, that's not what it's all about. Right? I mean, it was really, what's really bad is uh, to arrange it so that you're at a dinner. 
right? And you've been invited over, and of course you don't decline gracefully. You go. <laughs> and uh, the, the food's passing around, and you just you don't say anything. You just don't take anything on your plate. And, uh, you know, then the host says, oh, you know, what's, what's going on? Well, you know, fasting. I didn't want to tell anybody. <laughs> Look, if you showed up to a dinner <laughs> and you're fasting, you did want to tell. So that's not why we do it. We do it for God. We do it for God. And look, if somebody finds out, they find out. But that's, that's not the point. The point is we do it for God. And if we do it for God, God sees it and God rewards you. And, it, and if you do it for other people, God knows that. He's that smart. He knows that. And he's not fooled. And it does nothing. Whatever spiritual insight you were looking for in that fast, heaven is bronze to you. He's not going to answer. He has no interest. Because you're just doing it to be seen. All right, look, look back at Matthew 23. So that's what Jesus is talking about here with this whole business of um, being called rabbi and, and wearing these big phylacteries, which was like a, a, a prayer box that they wear on their head. And, and these guys, they get the really big ones. You couldn't miss it. And uh, they wore the special uh, clothing. And, you know, there could be a time for special clothing. I don't think that's necessarily sinful. But again, it's the heart. Are you, are you doing it to respect God? Or are you wearing that so that people will say, oh, he must be a minister. See how he's wearing that uh, tie? I, we don't really have like the big robes like in, in other cultures. But um, All right, look at verse 13. Now we get the seven woes. Are you ready? Okay, this is just, just to clarify, this is not like a woe for a horse. Okay, woe for a horse is like, whoa, boy, slow down. This is... Uh, this is an intense uh, warning, okay? Like, whoa, serious, okay, you ready? Verse 13, I'm just going to, what I'm going to do is just read through this whole thing, and I, I want to talk to you about the historical context, and then we'll go back through it, okay? So verse 13, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. They have fighting words, right? Uh, look, look at uh, the verse before that, verse 12. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Look at uh, verse 5. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. Before this point, Jesus is talking to the crowd. He's talking to the people about the Pharisees. At this point, verse 13, who's he talking to? He knows they're in the audience. He can see their big robes and their fancy you know, get up, and, he, and he, he looks right at him, and he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. He calls him out in a mixed crowd. This is intense. Verse uh, 14, second one. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across land and sea to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Whew. Verse 16. Woe, woe to you, blind guides, who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools! For which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it's nothing. But if so anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men! For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Verse 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but the inside are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee! First clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Verse 29. 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. I thought only John the Baptist said that. Oh, no. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that you may come on so that on you may come the righteous blood shed on earth. All the righteous blood that will be shed on earth. From the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Verse 36. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now reading this, you might get the impression that Jesus is just angry. He's just lost it. I mean, he is just livid at these people. They don't believe in him. They criticize him. Wherever Jesus goes, he preaches to the, to the crowd, to like farmers and just fishermen, regular people. And then the Pharisees come in afterwards and they say, did Jesus wash his hands before he ate according to the tradition of the elders? These people, they don't know, you know, they, they, they don't, they're not experts on these things. Jesus, that's not what's going on here. Jesus isn't just mad. He's not just mad. Jesus knows something about what is to come. Um, look at just the next verse here. In, uh, it's actually a chapter over, but it's, the original did not have chapters in it. Jesus left the temple, was going away, when his disciples came to point out to him the building, buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. See, what Jesus had just done in prophetic, uh, classic prophetic manner is he, he, had, he had called a curse down upon this group of people for their hard-heartedness. Now, these guys all know, for the record, that there is a way out. There's always a way out. It's called repentance. I mean, you remember Jonah the prophet? Jonah didn't preach to them, well, you guys should really repent. No, he said in 40 days you're going to be destroyed. Period. There was no unless you repent. And then they repented. And then God saw their repentance and they weren't destroyed. I mean, they, these guys have the Bible. They know that. So Jesus, he is preaching it as hard and as, as strong as he can because he knows what's coming. He knows what's coming. In... Um, uh, Verse 36 there, he says, Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And as it turns out, this, nobody's really sure about the timing of everything, but the, G, Jesus' ministry is in the early 30s, typically. It's definitely between 26 and 36, for sure, because that's when Pilate was in charge. But uh, probably the early 30s. So in the year 66, there was a great Jewish war which would have been 30 to 35 years after Jesus said these words. There was a great Jewish war. The, the Jews fought the Roman Empire. And how it started is there, there were some anti-taxation protests. Not much has changed uh, in, the, in the world. Taxes are still <laughs> controversial. Um, there's anti-taxation protests. So what the Roman governor did was, all right, you don't want to pay your taxes? He went into the temple and he took all the money out of the temple. He robbed the temple. And as a response to that, I mean, because that is the most offensive thing you could possibly do to the Jewish nation, is to rob the temple. So in response to that, they just went crazy. And they killed, they surrounded and they killed the Romans in the, in the, in the garrison there in Jerusalem. And everybody fled, the, the Roman uh, officials fled, including uh, Herod Agrippa II, from Jerusalem. And now it's go time. We've got a free city. But just until the Roman army comes, right? 
So uh, it, it gets serious. What the Romans decide to do is they sent the 12th legion of Syria down, which is about 6,000 soldiers, trained Roman soldiers. And uh, somehow or other, the Jewish guerrilla warriors were able to ambush them and destroyed the entire 12th legion of the Roman Empire. And they took the Aquila. The Aquila was a golden eagle standard that the, the army would carry with them. And it, it symbolized that legion. The Jews took it. I mean, once you take one of those, I mean, it's, it's go time. Because, like, Romans will spare no expense to get it back, uh, even if they have to build a wall across all of Scotland, uh, which they did. But um, anyhow, so this thing escalates and escalates. And there is freedom for a little bit in Judea and in Jerusalem. But the Jewish rebels start fighting each other in the city. And uh, there's a lot of controversy. So the Roman Emperor Nero sends a general named Vespasian to attack and to deal with this little revolt in the year 67. And he gives, he gives Vespasian four legions, which works out to about 20,000 or over 20,000 soldiers. And uh, so what they do is they attack the strongholds in the cities, not in Jerusalem, but like throughout the countryside. And this results in thousands of refugees pouring into the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is just like swelling way beyond its normal capacity. And a lot of these people that come into Jerusalem at this time are the rebels, the zealots, the people that are not going to be easy to work with. Um, so then what we had was infighting in Jerusalem where you had the Sadducees who were in power and then the zealots were trying to get into power. And then you have the Sicarii, who are these like weird guys, with these curved blades that assassinated people in the middle of the night. I mean, it's just chaos in Jerusalem. And um, Vespasian has to go back to Rome to become the emperor because Nero dies. And he sends his son Titus in his stead. And what they are able to do then under Titus is Jerusalem is surrounded by not one, not two, but three walls. That's how you do it in the old days, right? So you got three walls, and the Romans, boom, right through the first wall, no problem. Boom, right through the second wall. But that third wall, that inner wall, super thick, super thick. So they siege the third wall, and they're outside the walls seven months, seven months. Now, I told you there's all these extra people in the city of Jerusalem. There's only a limited amount of food supply. There's a limited amount of everything. And during this whole time, you can read all about it in Josephus. He wrote endlessly about what it was like in the city and what was going on. But it was just absolute chaos, terror, fear. You have 20,000 Roman soldiers surrounding your city. Every bed is taken. The, the roofs people are sleeping on. The streets people are sleeping in. Right? And you know the end is near. There's no escape. So... To make matters worse, they're fighting with each other. There are these, all these like coup attempts. And at one of these attempts to, to, to seize power, one of the Jewish fighters burns the entire food supply for the city. Can you imagine that? So now people start to get hungry. And then people start to starve. And, they, and the only way to survive is like, if I don't go rob somebody else of what food they have, then me and my family are going to die. This is the kind of situation that we're talking about here. Some people escape the city. They're like, I'm just going to, I'm going to take my chances with the Romans. The Romans would capture you, put you up on a cross, and crucify you within sight of the city walls. 500 a day. This is what Jesus sees when, he, when he's talking to these men. This is what Jesus sees. I mean, maybe not every little detail, but he knows these guys hold the line. The Pharisees, the scribes. He knows that these men are, are the ones who are protecting the people from believing in Jesus. That's not a good protection. He knows that these guys, because of their stubbornness, because of their rejection of God, it's not Jesus, it's God's Messiah. Because of that, this is their fate. In this generation, these things are going to happen. And in the year 70, when they finally broke through the third and the thickest wall... <coughs> They came in, and those soldiers went crazy, slaughtering, capturing, burning. They burned the temple, the holy temple. It's never been rebuilt. The temple they burned in the year 70. 
and they burn much of the city. And every survivor that they could find, they enslaved, they marched them all the way up to Rome, and they had a big parade, and they, they carried through the center of Rome the holy implements of the temple. There's an arch in Rome today called the Arch of Titus that commemorates this victory of the Romans. So, Jesus... I mean, how would, you, how would you speak to somebody if you know all this information? Would it be like, well, excuse me, um, if you don't mind, could you please just, like, be a little more tolerant of my ministry and um, just, like, uh, just let the people decide? Would you speak to them that way? No, you hit them with the woes. You hit them with the woes, and you, and you do a full set of woes, seven. Woe to you! Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He's calling them out because if he doesn't reach them now, their fate is sealed. Their hard-heartedness, one thing is going to lead to the other, it's going to lead to the other, and eventually they're going to face this catastrophe from which Israel really did not recover to this day. They still have not rebuilt the, this temple that was there. And that was 2,000 years ago. Um, look at verse uh, 37. This is Jesus' heart. Oh, Jerusalem! Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. Jesus wants, like just like a mother hen, Jesus wants to gather the city to himself. But he knows they won't and he's looking at the people who are holding the line that are rejecting Jesus. So let's look at these woes. Um, we're not going to read through all of them again, but I just, I just want to point out some things. So the first one is in verse 13. That's where you shut the kingdom in people's faces. That's what they were doing. They were shutting the kingdom in people's faces. Jesus is preaching the kingdom. Jesus is offering a way of salvation. And these Pharisees are saying, he's whack. Don't listen to him. They're shutting the kingdom in people's faces. Not only that, if they actually become a follower of the Pharisees, well, we'll look at that in the next one. They, they, verse 15, they great, they, 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 there's this huge effort to make converts, right? You're going you're gonna to cross the sea. You're going to cross the land. And you finally make a convert. You, you make a proselyte. You make somebody who's going to be a Pharisaic Jew like yourself. And they're twice, a worthy, twice as much a son of hell as yourself. What did, what did the Pharisee do? The Pharisee duplicated another Pharisee. But that's the whole problem. They're still a Pharisee. What's the problem with the Pharisees? is they're, they're preaching one thing, but they're living another. They're not righteous. Outwardly, yes. Out, if you see them out in public, oh, they're going to say the right thing. But they're not truly righteous. Look at uh, the next one is uh, verse 16. Blind guides, they use technicalities to invalidate oaths. So that means that you're in a business deal with somebody, and uh, you say to them, well, I'll... Uh, I'll bring the goods, you know, Friday. You say, well, you know, how do I know you're really going to do it? You say, well, I swear by the temple. I swear by the temple. You give me the money, Aaron. You give me the money. I'll give you the goods Friday. And uh, I swear by the temple, right? So then I leave. I pocket the money. No goods. What is that? That's invalidating an oath, right? Well, it's uh, stealing, yeah. <laughs> but, then I, but then I run into Aaron later on. He's like, what's wrong with you? Like, why did you... And he said, well, I didn't swear by the gold of the temple. <laughs> I just swore by the temple. Like, who, who believes an oath on a temple, right? The gold is what makes a temple the temple, right? So that's, that's what's going on. And so Jesus is like, you guys are... I mean, this is what they're doing. They're ripping people off, and they're saying, oh, it wasn't the gold. Oh, I swear by the altar. Maybe that worked a couple times. They said, no, no, no. It wasn't the gift on the altar. It wasn't the animal being sacrificed. It was just the altar. Unbelievable. Um, and I, I don't think, I, like, this whole, this whole long one here, verse 16 to 22, I don't think Jesus is making this up. I don't think he's using it like, uh, you know, he would make up stuff like uh, the prodigal son. He would make up a story to teach a point, you know, parables, illustrations, that sort of. I don't think he's making, I think this is, this is what they were doing. He's calling them out on it. And then, uh, Verse 23, you have the fourth well was extreme precision in tithing. Extreme precision. Uh, they're, they're tithing their, their herbs from the garden. But 
but then a wholesale miss of the weighty matters, right? What are the weighty matters he lists here? Justice, mercy, faithfulness. So yeah, yeah, you tithed. Good job. You followed, you followed the law of, of, of what God has said, and you tithe. That's, that's nice. Good job. But you're unmerciful. You're unfair. You have no faithfulness, right? These are the weightier things. And Jesus says, these you should have done without neglecting the others. Do it all. And then the next one is uh, verse 25. Clean the outside, but inside you're filthy. And he, he mentions greed and self-indulgence. So that you look good on the outside, but inside your, your motivators are like, I just need more. I need more. I don't have enough. I need more security. I need more enjoyment. Self-indulgence. So you're all about yourself. And then uh, number six, whoa, well, verse 27, you're outwardly righteous, but inwardly you're hypocritical and you're lawless. Inside, you're lawless. And then the seventh woe, you memorialize the prophets, but then you persecute the prophets. So the dead prophets, you're like, oh, yeah. Isaiah, true prophet. But then John the Baptist, yeah, let's cut his head off. <laughs> right? So you're going to, and you're, they're persecuting Jesus, and Jesus knows that a, a, after everything happens with him, he's going to send out prophets and apostles and people and these are the very same people that are organize, going to organize the stoning, persecution, the imprisonment of these very people that they're memorializing the dead ones. So he calls them out on it. This applies uh, certainly to teachers and pastors. I mean, what is, what is a scribe other than a, a scholar, a Bible scholar? And what is a Pharisee other than a pastor? You know, somebody who uh, holds that position. And so, like I said to you before, this weighs heavily on my own soul. And I, and I, I fall short. So, so don't look at me like that. I fall short. <laughs> you know? And I need God's grace. And you need God. We, we need God's grace. Because we are not perfect. We are not um, uh, the, the kind of people that look. I mean, look at us today. Sunday, we smell nice. We look nice. You know, I've got this colorful tie my wife picked. You know, you've got whatever you've got. And... You know, we look so good. But we can't see on the inside, right? And certainly not when we're under pressure or stress or anxiety-ridden and the sorts of things that we let fly in our minds or out of our mouths, right? I mean, that's, that's hypocrisy. We need, to be, we need to be integrated, holes. On the outside, same as on the inside when it comes to these things. So let me, let me go through these again, because I think this is really important for all of us. I think it's really important for pastors and teachers especially, but it's, it's important for all of us, because it says here, the, the first woe, you remember, is excluding people from the kingdom. Right? You shut people out of the kingdom? I think we do this. I think we're guilty. I think we see some random guy with, with, with tattoo sleeves, and we say, oh, he's, he's not interested in the gospel. I'm not going to talk to him. Or we see some, some person in a business suit, and we say, oh, they already have it all. They, they wouldn't, I, I'm, not, I'm just going to keep my faith uh, private in this, in this conversation. Even when the opportunity comes up, we're, we're going to exclude people from the, are we going to do that? Are we going to look at somebody and say, ah, they're, they're, they're too this or, or not enough that, and exclude people from the kingdom? We see a gay couple and we say, oh, they've already made their choice. I'm not going to share the gospel with them. What is that? We're going to exclude them from the kingdom. Ridiculous. We can't, we can't do that. Or what about uh, the second one there, which is making converse twice a child of hell. Uh, you know, we, we, we spend so much time trying to convert those who are closest to us. And that's understandable, right? Our family, our close friends. We will spend years and years trying to, trying to convert a high school friend to the faith, right? Meanwhile... If they ever actually come, they're coming because you, you, they know you really want them to come. So, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's good as, as a starting place. But if they come and there's no heart change, then what do we end up with? A critic? Somebody who's, who's not even there for the right reason? You know what I mean? Like, that's what we need to do is see where God is at work, right? We need to see in our own lives... Where is somebody receptive to hear the message? I mean, keep praying for your family, obviously. You know, but what we need to do 
is be open to everybody. And then the number three one there, uh, technicalities to invalidate oaths, right? So we do this too. We, uh, we justify sinful behavior on technicalities. Uh, we're filling out our taxes. Dependents. Hmm. Well, there's the kids. But then there's that hamster. And uh, that hamster is pretty dependent on me. And then there's uh, the cat. Uh, the dog, well, the dog died, but uh, he was dependent for some time, right? And we'll come up with technicalities. I'm not saying you do that specific thing, but, you know, that's how the mind works. We rationalize, we come up with technicalities to, to cheat. Um, technically, it's not breaking the law if we do this, right? That's the same mindset that they're using. Or what about the uh, clean on the outside, number five there, but inside are filthy, Oh, wait, I missed a tithing. Precision in tithing. Uh, So if we give to the work of God, if we tithe, we say to ourselves, I'm good. I'm good. I can can treat my wife like garbage now because I tithe. Isn't that that a temptation? Or, hey, uh, I did this good thing, so (coughs) now over here I, I I can rip somebody off or I can do something immoral. We have the, what I'm saying to you is we have the same issues. We are the Pharisees. We are the scribes. It's a human problem. These guys weren't just some wackos. They wanted to serve God. They weren't, they weren't evil. But they did evil. Because they were so obsessed with how people saw them and so obsessed with doing the right thing that they missed the right thing. The right thing was looking them in the face saying, whoa, 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 seven times over. How more could he have gotten their attention? I mean, would you throw this at him? Break some stuff? I mean, what, what, what else could Jesus have done than to do that? And you know what? They looked at him and they said, no. You're the problem, Jesus. We have it all straight. We have 200 years of history, of tradition. And that's just our sect. If we go back farther, we've got over 1,000 years. We've got a record that begins with Adam. That's what they could say to Jesus, right? Jesus is the Son of God staring them in the eye saying, you're doing it wrong. (laughs) And they're saying, no, you're, you're doing it wrong. So there's self-deception in our hearts, all of us. And there is hypocrisy in our hearts, all of us. And the only way to root it out is to honestly look inside and say, where am I cheating? Where, am I, where is my inside and my outside misaligned? And thank God we have 1 John chapter 1. Because without that, we are done. We are up the creek, we've got no paddle, and the motor's broken. Okay? Look at 1 John chapter 1. We'll end here. The simple fact of the matter is, with all of, with all of your sin, with all of our hypocrisy, with all of our issues, God still looks at you and says, I love you, and I want you, and there's a way out. And that's 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus died not for perfect people. Jesus died for those who, it says, were enemies of God. 1 John 1, 8 says, <coughs> if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Oh, there it is again. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good, Pastor. I, don't, I got no problems here. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You see where I'm at? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You hear it again? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Your problem, my problem, is we cannot clean the inside. I can shower. I can put on aftershave. I, I, could, I can dye my hair and, and get my face done and, and get other stuff done and, and make it look really nice on the outside. I cannot clean the inside. Can you? God has to do it. God has to do it. You see it right there? You confess Him your sins, and He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Gosh, forgiveness. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Do you want forgiveness? 
I mean, look, this has been a really convicting week for me. Reading this, I mean, it's just like seven arrows aimed right at, the, at center mass every time I read these woes. And uh, I need God's forgiveness. So let's, let's pray together in closing here. Father in heaven, we ask that you would give us a heart that is undeceived. Help us to see the truth as you see it in our lives. Help us to not make excuses for our behavior and our attitudes, but just help us to be like Jesus. Help us to have that heart for the lost. Help us to pursue holiness, but to do it in a compassionate way. Father, I ask that in the areas where we have fallen short, we confess that to you this morning. We know that you are a good God, a loving God, a merciful God. So we confess to you our sins, and we ask that you would forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And only when you cleanse us can we be clean. So we pray that this morning. We ask that you show us. Show us how to, how to do Christianity. Show us how to be like Jesus. Pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.